everyone, and welcome to Settings for iPhone for iOS 14. We're going to go over some of the key settings on your device to help you control what it does just a little bit better. Now, I can't go into every single setting that's on your device, and some of them have to do with privacy and just some confidentiality things, but we're going to go through most of the interesting ones that control what your device does. So we're going to go ahead and hit the Settings app. And right away, you're going to see a whole big laundry list of things. But at the very top, that's right underneath settings where you see my name. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different things in there that are really important. So the first thing we're going to do is touch on that. It's going to give you, this is my Apple ID email, uh, not for work, but for home. Uh, and you see a whole bunch of different things here, like name, phone numbers, and email. Uh, that's where you set up your email, your phone numbers for your device, and your name that you want people to see. Uh, you set up your password and security here. If you use um, Apple Wallet, that's where you set up your Apple Wallet payment and shipping information. And then for subscriptions, it will show you all of the different subscriptions that you have to different things. So if you have HBO Max or Apple TV or Apple Care or some of the other things that are, month that are yearly subscriptions or monthly subscriptions, they will be living here. Uh, for iCloud, if you go into that, you can see how much space your device has left. So my phone is a 200 gig phone, or a, actually it's, yeah, it's a 200 gig phone, and I'm using about half of that info. And you can see I take a lot of videos and photos, so that's what most of my uh, iCloud storage is going towards. So you can also see what apps are backing up to the cloud, which is important to know because this is going to affect how much um, your iCloud space is going to be used. And we all know that you have to pay for it. So you want to be judicious in what goes up to the cloud and what gets backed up. This is also important because if you get a new device and all of these things aren't backed up to iCloud, then when you log into your new device with your Apple ID and password, some of the things may not be there. So these are things to take into consideration when you are uh, upgrading your device. They always say to turn on iCloud for all of your items. So then you can get everything from your old device to your new device. So after iCloud, we have media and purchases. So this is where you can see your account and see, of course, Face ID didn't work for me. Let me try this again. Actually, we're not going to do that. We're going to try it again. Media and purchases. We'll view the account. So this gives me all kinds of information, including your family sharing. So you can share um, share app purchases with other family members. Uh, you can manage your payments here, which account you're going to use for payment through for Apple. Uh, and some other things like add money to account that's for Apple wallet and some other things that you may not be actually interested in. Uh, so let's go back out of here and find my is really interesting because this is find my iPhone. If you lose your phone, you can go to findmyiphone.com and you should be able to find your phone. That's only if this setting of find my iPhone is turned on. So I share my location with this device and I'm sharing with all of these family members. And that's how you can find your device and quite frankly, find other people if they consent to you doing that. So, and this next list is a list of all the other devices that I have that I've connected to through my phone. So if you touch one of these things, it should give you information about that device. So it tells me my find my iPhone is on, my iCloud backup is on, all my info, all my other fun stuff, and it's all there. And the same goes for all my devices. So that is that first setting uh, where my name is. The next setting I want to talk about is airplane mode. Really simple. Let's say you're on an airplane and you don't want to burn up your battery, so your battery, your phone isn't trying to search for that LTE coverage. If you put on airplane mode then your device won't be looking for that cellular signal. That's why they call it airplane mode because you use it in an airplane, but you can use it in other situations as well. Maybe you're, you're hiking somewhere and there's no LTE service, there's no cellular service, and you don't want your phone to be dead by the time you get off the trail or come out of an area where there's no cell coverage. If you, put, if you turn on airplane mode, it actually saves your battery when you're in those areas where there's not a lot of coverage. 
another thing you should know is that if you swipe from the middle of the screen down, this is your notification center. And if you go to the upper right-hand corner where your battery is and you pull down there, this is your control center. So this allows you to do a whole bunch of different things, including turning on and off your airplane mode, which is that little airplane picture in the upper left-hand corner. You can control those things and, and, along with Bluetooth and, and Wi-Fi and some of the other things. So that's actually a nice transition to Wi-Fi. When I hit Wi-Fi, this is where you would find a Wi-Fi network to connect to. Uh, so right now I'm at work, so I'm connected to the Satrum Public Library's Wi-Fi, but it'll also show you other networks that are in the area. Now, if your phone, if you're paying for cellular and you want to make your phone a hotspot, meaning make it, make it a like a Wi-Fi hotspot for other people to connect to with devices that can't connect to cellular, you can turn it on by uh, turning on hotspot. And then you get a code that you can give to other people and they can then connect to your phone like it's a Wi-Fi router. That's really kind of a cool setting. But you have to be sure that your subscription to your service with Verizon or T-Mobile or AT&T allows you to do that because sometimes there are additional fees involved with that. So after Wi-Fi, we have Bluetooth. So this is where you would connect a pair of earbuds or a smart speaker or to connect to a TV or a whole bunch of other things. My kids actually have um, lights in their ceiling for their rooms and they could connect to that via Bluetooth and change the color of the light. Uh, there's a whole bunch of different things you can see. I have a whole bunch of different things that I've connected my phone to. Um, but Bluetooth is also great for the car. And we'll talk about uh, car, Apple CarPlay a little bit later. But if you don't have Apple CarPlay, but you have Bluetooth in your vehicle, this is where you would connect um, to that. So after Bluetooth, we have cellular. So this says a bunch of different things. So I have Verizon and I have my cellular data turned on. So what that basically means is um, I'm allowing my phone to communicate with the internet through the cell, si cell signal that I get that I can also make a phone call with. Now, if you have unlimited data, this isn't an issue. But if you have a data cap, then you may want to consider turning this on and off. Uh, when it comes to cellular data options, I have data roaming on because, again, I have unlimited data. If you have a different plan that doesn't have unlimited data, you may want to turn this off. And I also keep voice and data on LTE because that's how I want to connect versus 3G, which is much slower. Uh, low data mode helps reduce cellular data usage. So if you see that you're getting near your data cap, if you have low data mode on, it will automatically slow down your connection. So there's a few other things here I wanted to go, up, go over with you. Setting up a personal hotspot is what we talked about earlier. This is where you actually set that up. Again, depending on how much data you have, it's gonna use a lot of data. Uh, Wi-Fi calling, I always have turned on because if you're in a place kind of like the library where cellular service doesn't work so well in the building, it will use the Wi-Fi as the connection to make your phone call. Um, and calls on other devices has to do with other Apple devices on the same Apple ID as your device or devices that you assign. So I have a MacBook Air at home. I have um, an iPad and I have an iMac at home. And the, with allowing calls on other devices means when I get a FaceTime audio call or I get a phone call, not only does my phone ring, my iPad rings, my iMac rings, my MacBook rings, and my Apple Watch rings. So, and you can actually pick it up, pick up that call on any of those devices, even if it's just a cellular call. This can be a little annoying and confusing to people. So I don't recommend keeping this on if you have another Mac device. Uh, if you just want to keep it to your phone, that makes a lot of sense too. Uh, carrier services, this is basically your star 73, your 411, all the services that you have with your particular carrier. SIM pin, you don't have to worry about, and don't worry about adding a cellular plan. That's something for the geeks to worry about. Uh, with cellular data, so current period, I don't really understand what this really means other than I've used 156 gigs for the current period, but they don't really tell you what that current period is. What's more important is the list of apps that you see here with the green light turned on and the green switch turned on. That means all of these apps are allowed to connect to the internet via my LTE cellular coverage. Now, if you wanted to limit certain things because you don't want them to connect 
or see where you are or what you're doing when you're out and around, you can turn these off. All of these things are using your data. So you may want, not want all of them to be on. Now I have unlimited data, so it's not a problem for me, but you may want to be discriminating and actually turn off some of these apps to keep them from connecting to the web until you're on Wi-Fi. So VPN is the next section, and this is an on-off button. So a VPN just means a virtual private network. I recommend getting a VPN if you're on public Wi-Fi. So here at work, I'm on a public Wi-Fi network. Uh, when you're sending and receiving data, it's not private. Other people who may have ill intent can get software or apps that can actually see what you're doing when you're sending and, sending and receiving data. So if you're surfing on the web with your phone or you're text messaging somebody, um, all of those things can be seen on an open network if you have a, a person there who's not doing things in, in your best interest. So there are a bunch of VPNs out there. I'm not gonna get into what VPN, what types of VPNs you can get, but there are tons of websites. I recommend going to cnet.com to um, take a look to see which are the best VPNs for you. And um, VPNs could be a discussion for another class at another time. Next section I wanna talk about is notifications. This is a great section because there's a lot of people who come up to us with questions about how do I turn this stupid notification off? It keeps binging and bonging and making all these sounds. How do I turn it off? You do that in this section, which is notifications. So for me, I have notification previews when unlocked. So if my phone is not locked, meaning I don't have that lock screen, I've opened my phone, I'll see previews on my phone that will flash up on the screen. Announce messages with Siri. You don't really want to have that unless you want Siri talking to you all the time. Siri suggestions. Uh, you can choose which apps can suggest shortcuts on the lock screen. I don't recommend putting this on either because it's just another thing that's going to be a distraction. So now in notifications, it will list every app that you have on your device, and I have a lot, that actually push notifications to your phone. So let's just take, let's go to Amazon. So I have Amazon. I have loud, no, loud notifications on, but I don't have it actually doing anything. So if I wanted Amazon to send me messages and I wanted it to be on the lock screen, I would put that on. So basically what that means is when my phone is locked, uh, the lock screen, if there's something from Amazon where they want to get in contact with me or send me a notification, it'll come up on that screen. And you'll see that with your other notifications. Uh, having on a notification center, now you can have all of these on together or any combination of these on or off. Notification center means when I pull down from the top, it's going to have that notification there. Banners means it's going to pop up across the top of your screen for maybe three or four seconds and then go away. You can turn on and turn off sounds. And badges, basically what badges are, if you've ever seen an app and it has a little red circle with a, a white number in it, like let's say you have 30 text messages or 20 emails, you'll see that red circle with the white number. That's what badges are. So you can turn them on and off as well. I find them kind of distracting sometimes. So uh, I have it turned off for Amazon. Uh, for previews, I have show previews when the phone is unlocked and notification grouping is automatic. So it's just basically gonna pop up. So every app you have on your device, in fact, I'm gonna leave that the way it is. For all these different things, I have different notifications turned on based upon the app and how annoyed I wanna be by getting by my phone vibrating, making a noise and telling me about something. So some apps are crucial for that and some apps aren't really that crucial for that. So that is how you turn on and turn off notifications. The next section is sounds and haptics. So what this basically does is you controls your vibrating when it ring, when your phone rings, vibrating when your phone is silent. So if you don't want your phone to vibrate when you have your, your audio on for your ringtones, you can turn that off. If you don't want your phone to vibrate when you've silenced it so it doesn't have a ringtone, you can turn that on and off. Uh, you can deal with your headphone. Um, safety so for some people who are walking maybe in the city they want to have their headphones in you could put on this safety precaution to that will measure audio levels and if it exceeds a certain if you're ex being too loud for too long you can put limits on that this is great for the kids 
uh, and reducing loud sounds um, can reduce sound that's over a set decibel level. Now, I don't have these turned on, but this could be good if you have a child and you don't want their ears to, you know, have some undue um, problem with, you know, sound hearing in the future. Uh, so ringer and alerts, you can control right now. My ringer is silenced, but I can, I can slide that across to, to change the volume. And I change with buttons means those two buttons, the volume buttons on the side of your device. Uh, you can use that to control your volume as well. Then you have a whole list of ringtones and sounds and bleep bloops and all that stuff. And you can pick which ringtone you want as your default ringtone, your default text tone, voicemail, all that fun stuff. And that's something you can get lost in for hours playing with. Uh, keyboard clicks. So if you type with your keyboard and it makes the clicking sound and you absolutely can't stand it, this is where you would turn it off. Uh, same thing with that lock sound. So, you know, when you press the power button and your screen times that, it makes that clicking sound. You can turn that off as well. Um, system haptics, haptics, kind of a hard word to say. I think they do that just to get us. Um, it plays haptics for system controls and interactions. So in other words, if your phone, if you have your phone set to do a certain vibrate when something happens, you get a text message or um, maybe something happens on Twitter, you can control your system haptics there. So going back out from sounds and haptics to do not disturb, do not disturb is great because you can have your phone silenced. Let's say you're in a meeting, you don't want to be disturbed, but you still want to have those notifications for when you when you come out of your meeting. Or maybe you don't want to be woken up at three in the morning from a text message from somebody. You can turn on do not disturb from here. But again, from that control center, do not disturb looks like the crescent moon that you see kind of in the center of the screen. If I put that on, now, my phone won't ring, nothing will happen unless it's somebody I assign that can pierce that do not disturb. So you can do that here in control center or you can do it here in do not disturb section. Now you can see here I have my do not disturb schedule from 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. And I have the, the lock screen dimmed during those times so it's not so bright at night. Um, so I also have my phone silenced when the phone is locked. So if it's after 10 p.m. and I'm texting somebody, um, I'm still going to get notifications uh, with Do Not Disturb. But if the phone is locked, then that won't happen. Uh, so you can also assign people in your contacts that you assign as favorites to pierce that Do Not Disturb. So maybe you want your son or daughter to be able to reach you anytime, day or night, but you don't want everybody to reach you. You can add your your son or daughter or that person you want to be able to reach you at all hours of the night, put them in your favorites and contacts, and guess what? The phone will still ring if you get a call from them. If you're in Do Not Disturb and you're talking to somebody who's not in your favorites and the phone drops, the, the call drops, the, the second call from that same person within three minutes won't be silenced. So if they call you back, you're not going to miss that call. Uh, do not disturb while driving. I recommend keeping this on automatically because if you're driving, your phone knows you're driving and will automatically put you in do not disturb mode. And it'll also tell, it'll also, if somebody texts you, it'll automatically send a text message saying I'm driving and you can control what that says. And you have that super says auto reply to in contacts. I have it for all contacts. And my auto reply says I'm driving, but will answer when I get to my destination. You can actually edit this and have it say whatever you want. But really, it's really good practice to not be distracted when you're driving. So having this on automatically makes a lot of sense for uh, Do Not Disturb while driving. So after Do Not Disturb, we have screen time. Now, I'm not going to get deep into screen time, but screen time will show you how long you're on your phone in a particular day. So for the week, right now, I'm at four hours and 27 minutes. You know, I'm not proud about it, but I am on my phone a lot, and you can see all the different uh things that you're doing uh downtime and all this other stuff so this is just a nice way to see maybe i'm on my phone too much um and this is also interesting as a um like an ice icebreaker if you're in a party or something you say oh you know how long i am on my phone let me show you where that is in settings so after that there's a section called general and there's a reason why it's called general because there's a whole bunch of sub settings within general so go ahead and tap general and the first thing 
is about. So it basically is exactly what you think it is. It's about your phone. It's your phone name that you've named your phone and you can tap that and change your phone's name. It's which software version, so which version of iOS you are on. So at the time of this video, we are at uh, iOS 14.4.2. Now iOS 14.5 is, is imminent to be released, um, but you know that's just what it is. So it also gives you your model. So if you're not sure which kind of iPhone you have, you would find that here. So mine is an iPhone XS Max. It gives you the model number, the serial number, uh, if you have Apple Care when it expires, how many songs are on your device, how many videos, how many photos, how many apps you have, your maximum capacity of your, on your device and how much is available. So if you're running low on memory, it'll let you know. Also has some other geek work, geek stuff here. Um, it also lets you know that you're on, you have Verizon or whatever carrier you have. And then all this other stuff is for the Apple Store. So let's go back out of About and let's go to Software Update. So maybe you heard there was a software update. If you hit software update, your phone should be able to check for the update to see whether or not there's an update available. And if there is, you can actually do that update. And if you have automatic updates turned on, then your phone will do it for you automatically. So it's not necessarily something you have to check. AirDrop is a wonderful thing that's come out, I guess, since iOS 13. And it allows you to share photos and documents and whatever else there is on your phone that's shareable via AirDrop. So AirDrop is a way to share between Apple devices. So let's say you have a picture on your phone and you want to share it with a friend and they have their AirDrop turned on. You can AirDrop to uh, everybody who has AirDrop turned on so they can see your phone if they go to AirDrop or just people who are in your contacts or you could turn receiving off. So you could still send, but you just can't receive. So What's great about AirDrop is you could take huge files, maybe a really long video, and you can AirDrop it to somebody. And so long as they're within five to 10 feet of you, believe it or not, it'll transfer to their device. They accept on their end, it sends it over, and it's much faster than any other way of sending uh, files. I'm a big fan of AirDrop. AirPlay and handoff. So automatically AirPlay to TVs, I have to ask first. So AirPlay is a way to actually share your screen with another device, whether it's an uh, uh, Apple TV, or maybe you have a smart TV that has um, sharing enabled, you can share there, or you can share with, um, with an, a Mac or another device. Uh, AirPlay is great because you can share your screen. This is great if you're at somebody else's house and you wanna show them a video and maybe you wanna put it up on their, their TV as opposed to passing your phone around. It, it really makes a lot of sense. Picture in picture is something that started with iOS 14. And I believe it's for I, uh, app, uh, iPhone 8 and newer. So let's say you're watching a video or you, let's say you're FaceTiming and you're FaceTiming with somebody and then you need to look something up. If you swipe up, the you'll have a picture in picture. So basically the person you're FaceTiming with, you, you can still see them and they can still see you while you're doing something else on your phone. The same also applies for YouTube. If let's say you're watching a YouTube video about cooking and you need to look up a particular recipe or a particular ingredient because you don't know what that ingredient is, you can go to Google and still watch the video in the corner of your screen. Uh, CarPlay. So if your car has Bluetooth and has CarPlay software in the radio, you can connect your phone to Apple CarPlay and be able to customize which apps are on your screen. Now, not every app on your device will translate to CarPlay, but most of your audio ones will. Your Spotify, iHeartRadio, uh, your music app, your phone app, or your navigation apps. Believe it or not, text messages, you can have CarPlay read your text messages for you, so you don't have to read, read it yourself. Um, there's podcasts, there's news, your calendar is actually there. Uh, there's settings, and then there's old library. There's some library services like Libby that's there as well. So you can take advantage of that in Apple CarPlay, but your, your vehicle has to have Apple CarPlay um, in it in order for it to work. So out of Apple CarPlay, iPhone storage. So earlier I showed you uh, where you could see your iPhone storage, but you can actually see it here with greater detail. So what this is gonna do now is show me that um, 
I'm using 103.2 gigabytes of a 256 gigabytes on my device. So apps take a large majority of the storage, then messages, which is text messaging, then media, which is probably videos and stuff like that. Uh, and then after that, it's other, and other can be a whole bunch of other things. So if you are running into a problem where you're running out of space on your phone, you can turn on uh, offload unused apps. And if there's an app that you haven't used in maybe a little while, it will automatically delete those apps. It doesn't mean that they're gone forever. You can still go to the app store and get them again, but it saves space on your, uh, your phone. Same thing with auto delete old conversations and text messaging. Now, I don't necessarily like that because I do need to reference old text messages from time to time. But if you have this enabled, you can see I would save 4.61 gigs of space. And then when you scroll down, you'll see which apps are using the most memory on your device. So text messaging, 29 gigs. Yes, I have a problem with texting. Uh, after that is music, iMovie, photos, Outlook, and you can see the number drops drastically. So you can see which in this section of settings, which uh, apps are the memory hogs. So you can actually have a little bit more control over that. So that's iPhone storage. Background app refresh. This again has to do with your data. It has to do with your connection to the internet. So I don't want every app to constantly be sending and receiving and doing things in the background when the phone is sitting in my pocket or on my nightstand. So I only have certain apps turned on that are working all the time. Some of these are because maybe they're um, like DoorDash for delivery for groceries. Some of it could be, you know, gas, you know, uh, like BP is a gas app. So it needs to know, where, you know, certain info about me. Uh, I like to have my Gmail do things in the background. So when I go into my email, I can see what's going on. Uh, same thing with a whole bunch of things. But you'll notice I have a lot of them turned off because I don't want them using data. Now, I have unlimited data, but still, when you're talking about your phone doing this in the background, not only is it using data, it's also using battery power because it's using the battery to send and receive data. So it's a good idea to turn off the things you know that you really don't care about it checking in the background. So after background app refresh, we have date and time, which is pretty boring. If you are a military person or you live in Europe or you, you're just more comfortable with 24-hour time, you can turn on 24-hour time and it changes your, your time from, you know, one o'clock to 1300. Uh, I have my date and time set automatically to where I am uh, and I set my time zone for New York because that's where we are. Now, if I'm traveling and I end up in Sydney, Australia, uh, it will automatically change my time on my phone. So date and time is pretty straightforward. Keyboard. Keyboard's kind of fun because you can add keyboards. So I have US English, I have an emoji keyboard and a Bitmoji keyboard. A Bitmoji is uh, an app you have to add. And I can add a new keyboard just by hitting that. Uh, and then it controls what your keyboards do. So text replacement, if I misspell things, it'll automatically insert them if, if I tell it to. Uh, One-handed keyboard I have turned off. You can actually turn it on so you can type just with your right hand or just with your left hand. And then with all keyboards, I want auto capitalization, auto correct, which is both a blessing and a curse, uh, enabling caps lock, which means when you double tap the, uh, the caps button, it will lock it. Uh, smart punctuation automatically inserts um, your, uh, if you put one quotation mark another, it'll end it for you. Same thing with parentheses and commas and, and uh, periods and all that other stuff. Um, enable dictation is great because on the keyboard in the bottom right hand corner, if this is turned on, there'll be a little microphone and you touch that microphone and you speak into your phone and it types for you. I can't tell you how handy that is, especially if I don't know how to spell a word. I don't want to look silly. So I'll say the word and it'll spell it for me. So with regard to English, English is my um, language that I'm speaking. I have a check spelling. So this is great because you can have auto spell checking, predictive text, which is great because it'll pop up across the top as you're typing and the phone will actually anticipate what the next word could possibly be. So if you see it, you just touch the word and it automatically inserts it. Uh, slide to type is fun because instead of touch tap, touch tapping to type where you're touching each key individually, you can take one finger 
and slide it across all the letters of the word and it'll insert the word. So if you're typing the word the, you would put your finger on the word, on the letter T and dra drag it to H and drag it to E and then let go of the keyboard and the word the will pop up. And you can do that for just about every word. It's pretty amazing. Um, so the delete uh, slide to tap is just by actually after you type, if you swipe backwards, it will delete the last thing you typed. Uh, or if you hit the back, the back, I'm sorry, the back key, the you know the, the backspace key, it'll automatically delete the whole word. And for the emojis, it has emoji stickers. So you'll have a button on your keyboard in the bottom left-hand corner, looks like a little smiley face, and that's where you can add your emojis, which are faces and, and different icons and things, and that's a lot of fun. So after keyboards, we have fonts. Now, I don't have any fonts installed. You really don't have to worry about this. I'm happy with what it, the way it is. This is something for Uber geeks who want to change their fonts. Uh, language and region. Uh, so my iPhone language is English, but I also have a French um, uh, language added here. So it will automatically do French capitalization, French spelling, French grammar, the same way it would with English. Now, I also have English set as my preferred language order, where French would be second. And it's a little bit more about you. You live in the United States. We use a Gregorian calendar and we use uh, Fahrenheit as our temperature. And our region format is, you know, the date and the time. We, we put the month before the day. We're in Europe. They put the day before the month. And we put commas instead of periods to separate every three characters for money and for all that other fun stuff. So that's pretty straightforward. Uh, for dictionary, you can actually select different dictionaries that are part of the Apple um, universe. So I have the Oxford English, or the new Oxford American Dictionary, the Oxford American Writers Thesaurus, uh, the French Multidictionnaire de Langue de Francais, and some other things here. And there's actually an Apple Dictionary, and you can add other dictionaries if you want other languages to be put in here as well. It's easy just to stick with English because it's pretty robust. VPN and network. So my VPN is connected right now, and I use something called Tunnel Bear. Uh, if you would have to download an app for a VPN that you like, I'm not endorsing Tunnel Bear. It's one that I use, but there are many VPNs out there. Again, VPN is a discussion for another time. Uh, just know that it's something that protects you if you're on public Wi-Fi. Legal and regulatory, if you really feel like reading all this fun stuff, I don't, and I'm sure you don't either. You don't have to worry about that. So the next section is reset. So reset is a very important section because this can be dangerous. So let's go into reset and you're gonna see all these different things. Reset all settings should only be used if your phone is acting really weird. By weird, I mean like your notifications are messed up, uh, you're not getting text messages the right way, what it does is it resets all of your settings, including your Wi-Fi connection, everything, back to factory spec. Um, if you do this, it's going to reset everything back, and it's going to forget all of your autocorrect dictionary that you set up, all of your Wi-Fi networks that you've connected in the lab into, into since the last. It basically resets the phone settings, not the phone, but the settings, back to standard factory. Uh, erase all content and settings. You never want to touch that unless you you're ready to get a new phone and you want all of your information wiped from the device. If you hit erase all content and settings, it will erase your phone and erase all of your stuff. And you can't get it back until you log into another Apple device or re-log into this device uh, again with your Apple ID and password. And that's why it's so important to have everything backed up to the cloud as much as possible to iCloud because then your stuff will come back. Reset network settings is when you're having Wi-Fi issues or maybe even Verizon connectivity issues with your LTE, 3G, 4G. Uh, when you reset your network settings, it forgets all of your old passwords and Wi-Fi networks you've connected to, so you'll have to go back and put passwords back in again, but it will clear up most Wi-Fi problems if you're having a Wi-Fi connectivity issue. Uh, reset keyboard dictionary. So if you set your, your, uh, your dictionary for something you commonly misspelled to insert it correctly, it will wipe all that out. Uh, reset home screen layout will put all of your apps back in alphabetical order, the way they would be from the factory and the way they would be installed uh, in alphabetical order. So you would lose all your subcategories and submenus. 
um, a reset location and privacy, that will kind of reset and log you out of sharing with and find my iPhone and all that other stuff. So this is not a section you really want to be in unless you absolutely have to, or there's somebody, a, an IT professional that's work, walking you through something. So it's there, know that it's there, but try not to go into it as much as possible. And the last section in general is shutdown. So if you remember in the days of the iPhone 4s and the iPhone 5s and all that other stuff, the power button was on top and you would touch that to time your device out. Now, most of our power buttons are on the side. You touch it once, it times your screen out. And it used to be if you pressed and held it, you would get that slider to shut your device down. Well, that doesn't happen anymore. So now the proper way to shut down your phone is to go to settings in general and shut down. And when you hit shut down, you get the slider to turn off your device. And that is, if I unlock my phone again, how you would shut down your device. So that's general. So now we're gonna pop back out again and go from general to control center. Now, if you remember earlier, we talked about control center being here. You pull down on the right side of the top of the screen by the battery and you get control center. There's a whole bunch of stuff here and you can actually control what is gonna be displayed here in this setting for control center. So to have control center turned on to have access with apps, within apps means you, it allows you access to your control center when you're in an app. If it's disabled, you can't get into control center unless you're back at your home screen. So here's a whole bunch of different things that you can add as controls in your control center. And then there's even more things you can add, which I choose not to have because there's only so much information I wanna have in there. So this is how you control what content is in your control center. After the after control center, we have display and brightness. So in display and brightness, you can have dark mode, which makes it a darker screen, or light mode. And I have it um, in light mode until sun sunset, then it goes into dark mode. Um, and that again, it's light until sunset, and the phone knows when the sun sets based upon where you are. You can control your screen brightness here, and I have true tone turned on because uh, it makes a display uh, with ambient light conditions, it, it kind of auto corrects that. So if you're in a, if it's bright out, it will dim your screen. If it's dark out, it'll, it'll, it's going to correct uh, the brightness of your screen automatically. Night shift is turns your screen's um, lighting from a more blue light to a more amber light. And I have that set from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. Uh, auto lock is what drives a lot of people crazy. So maybe you're staring at your phone and after 30 seconds or a minute, it times out. This is where you can change that. Most people have it, it's default to 30 seconds. I change it to five minutes because sometimes I'm reading something and I'm not touching the screen. So this is where you would change that. Raise to wake means when you pick your phone up, it automatically, the, the home screen comes on or that lock screen comes on. So you can you know take a look at your phone without having to hit a button. Uh, lock and unlock automatically locks and unlocks your phone when you close or open an iPhone cover. That's if you have a, a case that's like that for your phone. That's something you see more commonly on an iPad. Text size. For those of us who are a little older and have glasses and that text size is just too darn small, this is where you can control your text size. So right now I have it set kind of in the middle, but if I slide my slider, you can see I can make it really big, like AARP big. But I, this is a good size for me. Uh, bold text you can have turned on. I don't recommend putting it on because it gets a little too overwhelming and a little too bold, for lack of a better way to describe it. Now, if you have one of the bigger screen devices, like this is an XS Max, if you have maybe an iPhone 11 Pro Max uh, or an iPhone 12 Pro Max or maybe an iPhone 7 Plus or 8, 8 Plus or 6 Plus, you have the option for display zoom to be zoomed in. This just makes the icons bigger on your screen and doesn't necessarily move them around. It just makes them a little bit easier to see. I have it on, um, but you can see the difference between the standard and zoomed. It, things are just a little bit bigger. You can see the icon buttons are a little bit bigger. The notification windows are a little bit bigger and all your buttons are just a little bit bigger. It helps if, if you're someone like me who has really big fat uh, fingertips, it helps to have larger buttons. So backing back out again, going from display and brightness to home screen, um, newly downloaded apps get added to the home screen if you want to, or you can have them added just to the app library only. So what is the app library? So I'm gonna to go to my home screen and I'm gonna slide across all my apps until I get all the way to the end. And that last screen now is something new. 
where Apple groups your apps into categories. So social is in one spot, productivity and finance, recently added. And if you don't know where it is, you can actually search your app library and look for that app. Type in Amazon, all this stuff comes up. So that's what the app library is. And that's what this home screen uh, setting is. So basically, if you want to create an app and you want it added to your home screen, have that checked off. If you don't want it added to your home screen, you just want it put in an app library so it doesn't take up space on your home screen, because some people live by the app library now, you can actually set it uh, just to go there. After home screen, we have accessibility. So this has a whole bunch of different things. This is for people who maybe have a vision problem or a hearing problem. Um, you could do display and text size here. This is kind of redundancy to the text size we talked about before. I wouldn't mess around with this too much. VoiceOver, you don't want to have on unless you have a, a vision problem where you really have trouble seeing people who are borderline blind because um, it will read the screen for you, which sounds great initially, but it gets really old really quick if you can see just fine because it kind of delays your moving to the next screen. Zoom, I have turned off, but if you do put Zoom on, if you double tap with three fingers on your screen, it blows your screen up ridiculously large. Uh, I had this on for a really long time, but I kind of turned it off because it inadvertently was coming on when I was doing other things. So I turned this off, but this may be something that works for you. Uh, magnifier I have on because it lets you use your device's camera to quickly magnify surroundings. When enabled, you can drag magnifier from the uh, app library to your home screen and add it as an accessibility shortcut. Uh, again, not something I would recommend. Spoken content, there's a whole bunch of different things here that I really don't want to get too deep into, like face ID and attention, switch control, side button, because there's a whole bunch of things here that I could do a whole class just in accessibility. So this has a lot to do with what your side button does uh, for click speed, and you can hold that power button. It used to be a power button for Siri, um, or a whole bunch of different things. There's a lot here. And it's not something I really want to get bogged down talking about. And if you have questions, you could always reach out to the library and we'll help you with this. So going out of accessibility, going to wallpaper. So this is how you control what your desktop background is. Uh, you can choose a new wallpaper from the stills that they, they give you as an option. Uh, or you can pick from your pictures that are on your device. So you could choose whatever you want to be your wallpaper or your lock screen. So I have these things turned on now and I have dark appearances, dark appearance dims wallpaper. So it will dim it when it's a, when it's, um, it will dim your wallpaper depending on your ambient light, which makes a lot of sense. It saves battery power. Wallpaper is a lot of fun. You can spend hours just playing with that. Siri and search. Uh, this is where you have your Siri uh, controls. So maybe you don't want to say, hey, Siri. Uh, you can turn that off and on. You can press the side button for Siri or not, which used to be the power button. Um, you can allow Siri when your phone is locked, which makes a lot of sense. If you don't want to open your phone, you just want to get a quick answer to something. Uh, you set your English, your language to English. Now I have my Siri voice set to female Australian. There's a whole bunch of different accents you can add. And that can really be a lot of fun. And these are limited just to English. So you have American, Australian, British, Indian, Irish, South African, and you can set your gender, which is fun. Siri responses. So I always want Siri to answer me instead of just putting the, the, um, the search results on the screen. Sometimes it gets a little annoying, but then again, you can control Siri's responses this way. Announce messages. So you can have Siri read out messages without having to unlock your phone. Uh, when second generation AirPods or some Beats headphones are connected, it will also play a tone and, and read the information to you through your headphones. So it does a lot of cool things, especially with messages. So if I'm, let's say I'm listening to a podcast or I'm listening to music and my phone is in my pocket, there'll be a tone that comes on and then Siri will read my text message automatically. So that's kind of handy too. So, my information has my contact information there. Uh, it, Siri will actually ask if you want to delete your Siri dictation history. Maybe 
you, it's like clearing things out. You can do that too. And then there's all kinds of serious suggestions and things. Then if you scroll down further, all of these different apps have some type of way that Siri works with them. So not every app you have will interact with Siri in this way, but you can see I have a lot of apps that do where you can actually set the settings for Siri to interact with those apps. So after Siri and search, we have Face ID and Passcode. So this is really important because this is where you set up your Face ID. So we're gonna unlock my phone. So I'm using Face ID for unlocking your phone. And just it just needs to be mentioned that if you're watching this after iOS 14.5 comes out and you also own an Apple Watch and you're wearing a face mask because you're out in the public, these are the days of COVID right now as we record this, so we still need to wear masks even though people are, you know, hopefully we're, we're coming to the end of the road for that. Um, if you have an Apple Watch and um, Face ID enabled with the new iOS 14.5, which should be coming out any month now, if your device knows that you're wearing an Apple Watch and it's on you, it will unlock your, excuse me, it'll unlock your phone. So that's not in this current version of iOS that we're talking about now, but these are the controls for using Face ID and passcode. Uh, you can reset your Face ID. You can actually add other people's faces to it. So maybe you want your husband or your wife or your mom or dad to be able to get into your phone. You can set up um, Face ID for them as well. Uh, and then there's some of these other things. And then you can turn off your passcode. You can change your passcode if you're actually inputting those numbers in when you're wearing a mask. Um, and then these are all the things you can do when your phone is locked. So that's Face ID and passcode. The next thing is Emergency SOS, which is kind of an important app to know about. Because if there's an imminent emergency and you don't have time to make that phone call, you can press and keep holding the side buttons or either volume buttons to make an emergency call. So I hit call with the side button. You, an emergency SOS is when you rapidly press the, the side button five times. And by pressing and holding the side button along with the volume controls will continue to work. But if you press the, that, side volume, that side button, which used to be the power button five times, it will make an automatic phone call. Um, so you may still need to specify an emergency service or dial when using emergency SOS in certain regions. But here in the United States, it's 911. So it will play at a horrible sound once it's enacted. So you know that you can get out of it before it actually makes that call. But it's something that's really good to have because maybe you're in a car accident. You can't actually make the phone call. You can press that side button five times and it'll make that emergency phone call for you. Uh, exposure notifications. This has to do with the New York State Department of Health. Uh, if you were exposed to somebody who had uh, been tested positive for COVID-19 and they had the same app, you can um, be notified that that person is near you. Uh, battery, which is actually really interesting and important because you can put your phone into low battery mode when, you're, um, when you wanna save battery life. Maybe you know you're gonna be in a place where you're not gonna be able to charge for a while. Uh, if you put this low power mode on, it temporarily reduces, reduces your background activity like downloads, mail fetch, until you can fully recharge your, your phone. And the big one is battery health. So if you touch battery health, it's going to tell you how much battery capacity you have left. Now, my phone is about two years old. So when I charge it to 100%, it really is like my phone being charged to 94% when it was brand new. As we all know, batteries don't last forever and they do have a half-life on them and they do not hold the charge after a long period of time. So this actually, this app, this part of the settings came about because of a lawsuit that was filed against Apple with regard to battery usage and battery drainage. So um, this is the result of that. So you can see my, my phone when it's charged to 100%. It's really only 94% from when it was new. So it's lost 6% of battery charge life, which is not bad. So if we go back out one, it's going to show you your charging. So I went down low last night um, and I was last charged to 92%. You can see now my battery charge is trickling down. And you can also see activity that would be limiting or using battery life in the, with those blue bars. So my screen has been on for four hours 
and 49 minutes in the last 24 hours and has been off 11 hours and 48 minutes. Yay me, I'm getting better. And then this next section is gonna show you what's using the most battery life. So again, text messages is 16%. Tunnel Bear, which is that VPN is using 12. Settings is using eight because I'm actually recording this video. And then it goes down from there. So this is really good to see. Maybe you want to see even what you're doing and to see what your activity is and what's using the most battery power. Because sometimes there are things that are using your battery power in the background you don't even know about. Like one example would be Stop and Shop. I haven't touched that app in days. Or Tile. I haven't opened that app in days. So it's really interesting to see what your phone is doing in the background. Now, right underneath where it says battery health, there's the last 24 hours, which shows what I did in 24 hours. Or I can look at the last 10 days of charging to see where I've been with regard to battery usage. So this gives you some really interesting data that you can you know, hopefully use to your advantage. After battery, there's privacy. So privacy has a whole bunch of different things. The most important thing is location services. So if your location services are turned on, you're sharing your location, can be used for location sharing with other people, like especially using Find My Friends. Um, you can actually set up location alerts, which uses GPS, Bluetooth, and crowdsourced Wi-Fi hotspots and cell tower locations to determine your approximate location. Um, and this is a list of apps that I've allowed to see where I am to make decisions. Now, I'm going to have to go back through this and maybe call some of this because I don't want them all to know where I'm doing. And some of these are always, some of them are while using, and some are never. So, again, this is a matter of preference. This is something you make a cup of coffee and you play with for an hour or two where you can turn on or off these things. So, let's go back up to the top and sharing my location on my phone, this device, and I'm sharing it with these people. So you can see exactly who you're sharing your information with. After location services, we have tracking. So I'm not allowing apps to request to track me because they don't want apps to track my activity. Then some of these other things uh, we can get into in another class, but those are the main um, parts of uh, privacy where contacts is one of them as well, where you can see which apps you've gained access to your contacts. Same thing with calendars, which apps are now interacting with your calendar. There is a reminder app, photos. It's interesting to see how many apps you've given access to your photos. Uh, Bluetooth, uh, local networks. So it goes access to your microphone. This is important because if you want your devices, if you want these companies to listen to you, um, they could be listening to you in the background. You may want to turn these on or off. Speech recognition is turned on for, for my work email so I can do some texting that way. Um, your camera, again, these apps have access to your camera. So you may want to go through all these and maybe cull out with regard to privacy what's allowed to use some of your devices because this is your privacy after all. After privacy, we have App Store, which is how your App Store is uh, configured. So I automatically download apps and all app updates are set to automatic, so you don't have to worry about going every day and checking to see if there's an update to your app. I allow cellular data for automatic uploads and I allow apps under 200 megabytes to download automatically. If they're bigger than that, then you have to ask yourself, why are they so big and maybe I don't want them on my phone? Video auto, audio play I have on, which automatically uh, plays app review videos in the App Store. And there's some other things too. Again, something you need to play with. Apple Wallet um, and Apple Pay. Uh, I'm not going to go into that because it has my credit cards there, but you can see what credit cards are there. You can add a credit card there. You can remove a credit card. Maybe it's expired or maybe you got a new credit card. You can control that there. Uh, the rest of these apps we're going to cover in a future episode, but we'll start with passwords and mail and some of these other things later. But those are the main apps that control what happens with your device. If you ever have any questions or you would like to have what we call Tech 30s, which are one-on-one -on -one appointments, 
with a member of our staff, one of our librarians, you can always give the library a call at 631-588-5024. And you can also email uh, the reference department, reference at sachemlibrary.org. And if you want to do anything with the studio, which is the library's makerspace, you can email us at studio at sachemlibrary.org. Again, my name is Chris. I'm glad you spent some time with me today going over some of the great apps or great settings that are controlling both your apps and your device. And we hope to see you soon. Come back to the library because we're always here for you.